Stay tuned. Coming up is part one of our two-part interview with retired Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief Vince Mulray and Battalion Chief Bobby Kennedy discussing their role in conducting a line of duty death after action review following the death of Lieutenant, of Lieutenant Matthew Letourneau on January 6th, 2018. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 401. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming and time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. There are 33 online training programs there for you to choose from. Some of the programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the Virtual Training tab. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, part one of my two-part interview with Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief Retired Vince Mulray and Battalion Chief Bobby Kennedy discussing the role they played in a line of duty death after action review following the death of Lieutenant Matthew Letourneau on January 6th, 2018. Hey everyone, Rich Gasway here, host of the Situation Awareness Matters show. Today I have two very special guests, Vince Mulroy and Bobby Kennedy from the Philadelphia Fire Department. And we're going to be talking about an after action review of a line of duty death incident that occurred in Philadelphia in 2018. So just give, let me give you a little background about the incident, then we'll bring the guests on and uh, let them introduce themselves and tell you about their uh, their background and their experience. On January 6, 2018, Lieutenant Matt Letourneau, a 42-year-old male and 11-year veteran of the Philadelphia Fire Department, died after becoming trapped from an interior structure fire collapse while engaged in interior firefighting operations. Two additional firefighters were injured during the collapse and one civilian occupant of the dwelling who was removed during initial operations also died. An after action review, AAR, was conducted by the Philadelphia Fire Department Health and Safety Office at the direction of Fire Commissioner Adam Teal to provide insight into the event and PFD operations from the time of dispatch to the time the fire was placed under control, a time span of approximately one hour and 57 minutes. A firebox assignment was dispatched at 8.51 and 43 seconds for a reported dwelling fire in the 2200 block of North Colorado Street. Responding units were forced to overcome significant impediments, including snow and ice-covered streets, temperatures of approximately 9 degrees Fahrenheit, with wind chills of minus 10, and limited apparatus access to the front of the dwelling. Engine 45, a crew of three firefighters supervised by... Lieutenant Letourneau was the first do engine company and the first unit to arrive on location. At approximately 8.55 and five seconds, Lieutenant Letourneau reported a two-story, uh, 15, er, 15 feet by 35 feet middle of the road dwelling with fire showing on the first floor. Lieutenant Letourneau uh, placed two engine companies and two ladder companies in service uh, to begin the initial fire suppression efforts. Fire companies on scene had a difficult time obtaining steady water supply, and the fire dwelling was extremely cluttered with debris, which posed an extreme hazard and complicated interior operations. While working to overcome difficult conditions, firefighters gained access to the first floor, removed the civilian victim, and eventually accessed the second floor of the dwelling to attack the fire and complete the search for occupants. At approximately 9.33, uh, almost 42 minutes after engine 45 was dispatched, an interior V-shaped collapse occurred, trapping several firefighters, including 
Lieutenant Letourneau. This is going to be a, a tough interview, I can tell already. Welcome, to, uh, Vince and Bobby, to the show. I'm glad to have both of you here. Thank you. Uh, before we start, why don't you tell me about your backgrounds and your your uh, career uh, in the fire service? Because I know Vince is retired now, but I'm, I'm sure you'll get to that. Uh, good morning, Rich. Thanks for having us. Um, so I started my career in 1988. I was uh, sent to the Philadelphia Fire Academy. I spent about nine weeks there. And by Valentine's Day, 1989, I was in the field. I was assigned to Engine 13 uh, in Battalion 3, which is the lower North Philadelphia area, the same area where we're going to talk about today, Colorado Street. I spent about three and a half years there, was promoted to lieutenant. Lieutenant for about seven years, captain for about nine years. Then in 2007, I was promoted to a battalion chief. Again, uh, during my time at the battalion chief, I went back to battalion three, which is the same area in lower North Philadelphia. I wound up spending three and a half years there. Uh, I get shipped back to the Northeast for a year, and I get promoted to deputy chief in 2017. When I get promoted to deputy chief, I land in the health and safety office for 2017 and 2018. We know January 6, 2018, Matt Letourneau uh, dies in a collapse on Colorado Street. The Health and Safety Office is given the task of producing an after action uh, review report. I put a small team together and we spend the next nine months gathering information, analyzing it, and producing a report. We kept that report as a draft probably for another two years until the department released it along with the NIOSH report. And we've been talking about this uh, fire ever since. Um, in this past summer, um, in 2023, I retired from the department. It's only been a few months, uh, but we're still trying to talk about this fire and to promote uh, the situational awareness and uh, the factors that contributed to this line of duty death. Yep. Well, thank, thank you for sharing that, Vince. Bobby, what's your background? Sure, thank you. Thanks again for having us. Uh, anytime we get an opportunity to talk about this fire ground in particular, um, the lessons learned and the critical factors that we determined here uh, are very important things that um, need to get out to the fire department. So we appreciate you allowing us to just to talk today. Um, but uh, I don't have as great of a resume as Chief Mulray um, has, um, but uh, uh, I'm a battalion chief right now in, in Philadelphia. I work in the neighborhood assigned to battalion three where this fire ground took place. Um, at the time of the fire, I was assigned to the health and safety office as a captain. And, uh, and that's how I got um, the assignment here with Chief Mulray. Um, but I, I went through fire school with Matt Letourneau. Uh, I knew him pretty well and uh, a, a very good person that if if he were here today, he would uh, he would be asking us, I think, to get the get the message out there and uh, let everyone know what happened on on that day. Now, that. Uh, fire that day, uh, if I understand right from our conversation before we hit the record button. You guys weren't responders to that fire, but you were tasked as from the health and safety office to come in shortly after the fire was under control and start the investigation, right? That's correct. Um, we were given the task by the Commissioner Thiel at the time uh, to create a report that was factual and um, that didn't have any punitive uh, connections to it, and that really told the story from the time of dispatch to the time the fire was placed under control. It was really a no-fault investigation. That was really what drove this, and uh, it was the reason we were able to get such great uh, cooperation from everybody we interviewed and everybody we came in contact with. Well, um, why don't you start at the beginning uh, of the process of conducting an after action review and just tell us how it played out. You know, you spent nine months investigating this or, or reviewing this, and it 
started with you getting a phone call to go out to the scene. So take us through the, the process. Rich, first, I'm going to start with talking about that there were three reports. Uh, there was an investigation report, uh, which was the fire investigation. It was the lead agency was the fire marshal's office in Philadelphia, uh, along with the uh, Bureau of Ac Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, along with the Philadelphia Police Department. They formed one unit and once uh, their investigation was complete and there was no uh, criminal connection to this particular fire, then it was really turned over to the health and safety office. The health and safety's office, as I said, um, was to, to produce a no fault report from the time it dispatched to the time the fire was under control. At the same time, NIOSH was invited into Philadelphia. And we all know NIOSH is the National Institute of Occupational Health and, and Safety. And they came in and they worked with us. Whatever NIOSH had, we had. And whatever we had, we shared with NIOSH. It was a seamless union that produced two reports that were, I think we're both proud of. Um, on the particular day, January 6th, I got a call about an hour into this fire. And I usually would get notified anytime there was a second alarm. Also, at that particular time, we activated the health and safety office response team, which was Bobby and I, and we responded to the scene. We got to the scene somewhere around 11 a.m. and 11, or 11.30, between 11 and 11.30. Uh, Matt was transported approximately 10.40 that morning, uh, right in there. So we visited the scene very briefly, and then we went to the hospital. Uh, there was some uh, issues with uh, collecting of the gear, uh, gathering of some information, gathering some evidence, and we were able to get that then. Let me go back to the scene. The fire marshal's office held that scene for approximately five days. It was this, this particular job happened on a uh, Saturday. They didn't clear the scene until the following Friday. Bobby and I visited the scene every day in order to gain information and to gain uh, evidence, any evidence that we could. So working closely uh, with the fire marshal, we were able to, you know, have the basis of information that once they left the scene and once we left the scene, we were never able to get that again. You know, once you give up the scene, you pretty much give up all evidence gathering at that time. So we went along uh, approximately a week or two weeks into this. We developed a um, mission statement. And we developed a mission statement after meeting with the fire commissioner. Uh, the fire commissioner gave us the authority to conduct the investigation. We produced a mission statement. He, he signed off on it. And that was really our marching orders for the next uh, six to nine months. He gave us six months to produce a report. It took a little bit longer, but, but it was, it, you know, it was worth the, the extra time we put into it. Uh, we started off, uh, like I said, gathering some evidence. Then we started off with the interviews. Um, and prior to interviewing as many people as we could, we put out a questionnaire. And a questionnaire was something I've done uh, for uh, critiques for extra long fires or for any fire that was a little bit different in my career. And it was to gather information of who I wanted to interview first. And that's basically what it was. And it, it was able, and it gave an opportunity for the members to put down on a piece of paper what they saw, what they heard, what they thought was good, what they thought was bad. And that was the, the initial step for the interview process. Then we took those questionnaires and we prioritized who we wanted to interview. And we interviewed um, the majority of the people on that fire ground. As we started the interview process, NIOSH comes into Philadelphia. And basically what Bobby and I did was we um, solidified our interview techniques because we were pretty much new to this process. Talking with NIOSH, we started to jointly interview people. The difference between NIOSH and the health and safety office is I, oh, I asked every person I interviewed if I could record their interview. And almost 100% of the people allowed me to uh, record it. 
NIOSH will not record their interviews. It's all handwritten. And once their investigation is over, those the uh, handwritten notes go away. So that's the biggest difference between NIOSH. But the assistance that we got from NIOSH for um, the technique of interviewing people and what we wound up finding, Bobby and I, is we would bring somebody in for an interview and we would spend 20 minutes to 30 minutes bringing them down, trying to make them feel relaxed, tell them that, hey, this is a no fault interview. All we're trying to do is get the facts out of this some of them brought union representation. Some of them brought their officers. Whoever they brought into the room, we had no problem with. But we kept it to Bobby and I because we didn't want a, a group of people that would intimidate somebody being interviewed. We tried to keep this as low keyed. We tried to keep it as honest as we could. And we tried to make the person being interviewed feel comfortable. And we also found that that was a, um, a therapeutic aspect of this that we really didn't uh, come into play. People wanted to tell their story. You know what I mean? And I think that it helped the person being interviewed. You know? And I think that's a, a value to the department. It's part of the, uh, uh, the grieving process. It's part of uh, making people feel whole again. So we went through that. Um, where we go from there, Bob? And we started to try and put together in on on paper um, what we found out. Um, it was a we did a lot of research into the neighborhood itself um, through the historical society. Temple University has a, a historical archive that we used. Um, obviously, with the collapse, we wanted to learn as much as we could about the building. And um, Chris Nam, who is a I think he's buildingonfires.com. He was a big instrumental part in helping us understand the engineering behind the construction. And um, and eventually we got to a, a first draft. And uh, from, from the first draft, we put together a team um, of experts from our department um, in all different aspects. Um, the captain of our heavy rescue, Rescue One, um, some chiefs, and... Uh, and we did a review of the draft just to make sure that what we the uh, the conclusions that we had drawn were valid and that it just wasn't um, Chief Mulray and I. And we, we had two other members that we worked with uh, very closely on the report, um, Jerry Kershaw and Brian Coughlin. We didn't want it to be our views. We wanted to make sure that it stood um, stood up to um, the you know critique. So that was a long process. It took about a week of review, going over every single line, every video, and uh, it was very helpful to us to learn more. Um, we've been looking at it for nine months, um, but having an extra set of eyes to, to tell us, you know, you're wrong about that. I don't think we're, and there was a lot of good back and forth. Um, we think we produced a solid report. Um, and, um, and, and then, it, and then it was almost two years of reviews from there, from that point forward, just making sure that the lessons that that could be learned from this uh, were actually put on paper. Let me ask a question. When uh, so I've been involved in some after action reviews where organizations will bring me in. I have a kind of a unique interviewing type technique that is able to draw out um, human factor and human error type lessons from people that if not if the question isn't asked they don't ever even know to give the answer uh, so the things that the thing that one thing that i notice is that if i interview oh it's not uncommon to interview 20 or 30 people that um the stories don't always align uh you know everybody's everybody's telling the truth but everybody experienced something different did you have instances where somebody said it was a and somebody else said it was b and then you had to try to sort it out and figure out was it a or was it b and you know which which one of these it can't be a and b so which one was was right did you have some of that occurring we, we had one situation where we were about three or four months into the process 
And we thought we had a pretty good handle on what was going on. And we had a schematic that we drew up and it was the, um, the members that were on the first floor. And I believe we had the number at six. And we felt pretty confident that we knew everybody who was on the first floor. We're doing an interview and we come to find out that there was a seventh person on the floor. And it, it took a little bit to find that person and to collaborate it with other people in the room, because you were talking about a, um, a, a, a first floor that's made up of three rooms. They're really only in two of them. It's not more than 20 by 25 feet. There were seven people in that room, but there was zero visibility. They, you couldn't see who was in the room and who wasn't. And, um, it was, it was like an eye opener for us. And we really slowed down our process after that. And we continued to check every fact that we thought we had. And, um, it was just one of those things where we felt confident we had six people, but reality, it was seven people. And even though we spent, you know, the better part of two years on this process, we're, we're still not sure we know everything that went on in this fire round. You know, there's in, in the report, we 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 mentioned that and and the word that we 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 say that um, there are there were slight differences between the actual and the recounted events, um, as well as inconsistencies and conflicting statements. Um, but but we believe we still believe um, that nothing that was said was a, a, an attempt to mislead mm -hmm. us, that it's just somebody saw one thing and somebody saw the, the next um there's a we we had seen a presentation that, that you gave rich um several years back and and you put a, a picture up on the board uh, on the screen it was it was a it was one it was a face but if you looked at it one way you saw a face look and you looked at it and and you had the entire room going um for 20 minutes what did you see and then you got the youngest guy in the room and you got the oldest guy in the room the 16 year old kid and the 76 year old man and said all right Show me where we, the moral of the story was they looked at the same picture, but they saw it's two different images. And, and that that's, that's true. And that's what happened. Um, we learned a lot and what really benefited us and modern technology was um, the police officers at the time had body cam footage. We had a lot of cell phone video before the job started. And then during the job from civilian cell phone cameras, um, we had helmet cam video. So um, had we not had access to that, it would have been more difficult. But every time we conducted an interview, each interview went sometimes hours. Um, we had an idea of what we wanted to get out of the interview, um, what we thought we, what could be provided to us by the, by the member we were interviewing. We had done our research before. Um, we had diagrams and maps and charts, and we heard what they had to say. And then there was a day after every single interview, we would spend an entire day going back through the interviewing and then trying to corroborate video evidence, looking at um, or listening to the audio from the fire ground, maybe going back to the scene and saying, how is this going to work if if they say they're here? But then this happens, you know, probably this is probably standard for any investigation that anyone does. But for us, it was it was new. Yeah. Um, but everyone that we interviewed, everyone that we spoke with, I think had the same goal in mind, which was not to let this happen to somebody else, uh, to get the message out there, because that's what Matt would want, I think. When, uh, let me ask a question about process here. When, when the two of you come into the health and safety office, um, I, I'm sure that what you're probably your your secret wish is that you don't have a line of duty death that you're going to have to do an investigation for you know you can get out of the you can get out of there before something like that happens absolutely but uh it did happen and my question is um when you come into a position like this and i'm just curious and this could be like any fire department not just philadelphia but is there any training that's provided like, hey, if, if you have uh, an incident that happens that you're going to have to investigate a near miss or a line of duty death, we're going to give you training on how to be interviewers and how to use uh, uh, certain types of questioning and how to use a protocol and how to sort it out. And, you know, do you get do you get training on that or was this like on the job? I'm learning as I go here. 
there, there's no actual training of, for that, as you know, but um, our commissioner was part of um, a group that wrote uh, an after action review guidebook. And we happened to find that in our research. And the IAFF also has a line of duty death investigation handbook. And I believe we use both of them. But we also used um, other departments um, reports from Boston, for instance, we thought there was a lot of value in that one. And we um, used a lot of the techniques that they used. Um, but for actual training, the answer obviously is no, but there is a lot of reference material out there. And as I mentioned earlier, we use the expertise from NIOSH to guide us through our investigation. I, I can't give them credit enough and we still deal with NIOSH, unfortunately, today, uh, and we have for the last five years. I mean, uh, NIOSH has been to Philadelphia more times than either one of us want to count. Uh, but every time they've come to town, they've always left it better than they found it. They always left us with a report or they left us with um, a piece of knowledge that's going to help us going forward. We also, uh, the department was in the midst of finalizing a um and after action for uh, an additional line of duty death that happened um, shortly before Matt Letourneau died. Um, and we had the opportunity on the way down to the, the fire ground. We were on the phone um, with the chiefs that were conducting that. Hey, what do we have to do today? What's important? And, and they really gave us a good blueprint um, and a roadmap to be able to get through those first couple of days. Um, commissioner was a good help. Um, and we had a lot of resources in the department, but there was no standardized. Right. And, and it was actually a recommendation in our report that the department have a team of trained members that, that can respond um, to instances like this or other serious events. OK, just curious as to <laughs> how you how you how you uh, make how do you keep from getting overwhelmed when. There's so much to do, but you don't necessarily know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so talk me through some of the things that came. Oh, did you did you have some video you wanted to show or is that going to come later on here in our conversation? It probably should come a little later because it'll yeah. we could set the stage with okay. what happened from the beginning. Whenever you whenever you want us to go there. Okay, okay. yeah. Just um uh you know, take us t take us through some of the things that you uncovered, and uh, um, you know some of the lessons that were learned. Uh, the sequence that you took in the after action. Um, how did you assemble your team? I mean, the whole every there's so many things to be learned from this. So I'll just I'll just take the last thing you mentioned: how we assembled the team, and um, it was probably you know, you know I hate. Bobby doesn't like me to talk about the shortcomings, but one of the, the shortcomings I felt <laughs> was I was the uh, deputy chief in charge of the health and safety office. So I embedded myself in this team and it was myself, it was Bobby, it was a captain we had, and I brought in a lieutenant. There were four of us. Uh, one of the prerequisites we had for anybody being on our team was they didn't have any connection to this fire ground. So there were some people that we could have used, but we didn't use because they were the safety office in the safety officer in the rear, or they were part of some unit that we were going to be looking into. So we didn't put those kind of people on our team. Um, one of my responsibilities was to still run the health and safety office and conduct this investigation. Bobby was in my office every day, but I still had what I consider task level stuff. I still had to pay bills. I still had to supervise the uh, infectious control office, the PPE uh, dis dis distributions. There was a whole host of things that were going on that I still had my hand in while also doing this. Uh, I think one of the recommendations going forward were, would be you can't have the same person running the health and safety office and also running the investigation. And we had a line of duty deaths since then. And I think that they took that recommendation and a lot of the work was uh, distributed out to people coming in to help. They had their, the team that they have now is a lot larger than the four people that we used for this particular after action review. 
Um, you know, I think you got to think big. You got to think bigger. You got to have a lot of people helping. And like I said, we use four people. We would not have uh, gathered the amount of information or did the leg work. I mean, we had to go send the SCBA to Intertech. Well, somebody had to go. If I would have went, it would have been two days that I would not have been in the office handling the regular stuff. Um, we had to send someone down to the, the uh, city of Philadelphia archives, you know, finding out when this house was built was a big piece of this. Our, uh, our data that we had from the Department of License and Inspection told us 1925. You take one look at that building, you know it's not 1925. So we had to go put the white gloves on, send a guy down there, find that book that had the original deed. And that's why we know in the fall of 1888 that this house was occupied the first time it was occupied. What also helped, I think, was the way that the team um, was managed. Uh, all four of us know each other. Um, rank never came into play. Um, we had we had good discussions and we had good arguments. And uh, I think if everyone agreed with everything and just went along with it, the report wouldn't be as good. But everything was under intense scrutiny um, from our team. We wanted to get it right um, with all the information that we knew. Of course, um, you know, it's hard, but um, but feelings didn't get hurt. And at the end of the day, we looked at it and we said, you know, M Matt died. Um, nothing that we're going to go have to talk about is going to be as bad as that. At the end of the day, the goal is to make sure that no one dies in the same fashion and uh, that we get the lessons learned out. And that was always the driving force behind this is tell tell the story and um, and make sure that we can maybe help someone of one other person. One other thing I want to mention that I think that we learned in this process is early on, we had um, four people doing four different things and we were looking for uh, written input from everybody. So if I had someone do the bio for Matt uh, and they wrote it and we had somebody else write another segment of it, the writing styles were all different. So after a while, we realized we needed a principal writer. Bobby was the principal writer for the whole report. And it carries through where you can see that, that it's not choppy. It wasn't different people putting their input in. And I think that's a real important thing because I write different than you do. You write different than Bobby. And it's, it's, it's just the way it is. And uh, he's a strong writer and he's a quick thinker. So he was the perfect candidate. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> point. I've, I've uh, <laughs> not not on this scale, but I've jointly authored articles with someone yeah. else, and then I'm like, you know, you write your part, I'll write my part. We'll put them together, and then we have the article. Oh no, 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 no! Yeah. It 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 is so huh. it is so obvious and frustrating that when when the styles of writing don't align, and to the end reader, I can just imagine, yeah, you know, it's it's almost <laughs> for me it's unbearable to yeah. try to see two completely different styles try to be uh mended together it just it doesn't work so good on you we for were fortunate uh, that. of all four people that are on that team each person individually could have written the same report you know that it wasn't this one did this everyone was capable of it i just was the one that got picked to do it um so it, it wasn't you know it, it, you would have had the same work from any one of them. Okay. So continue on. So we, we do all this um, in interviewing uh, and gathering facts, gathering information, and we start massaging uh, the contributing factors. We're trying to put this report together. And we came up with nine contributing factors, which are uh, time, delayed expansion of the incident command system, excessive clutter, extreme weather, water supply, crew integrity, situational awareness, and communication. We felt that those nine pieces uh, revolving around a circle all had impact on this particular fire ground. And you know, the, the first part of the report is written, um, it's the event. And then the second part of the report is really the analysis. And it's these nine factors that make up that analysis. But I'm really putting the uh, cart before the horse because we really haven't gotten to uh, the event at this point. And I don't know if this is a good time to talk about the, uh, 
the neighborhood and the building a little bit. Sure. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, is it best to share my screen with you for a, a couple yeah, diagrams? Yeah, okay. Sure. All right. Just to talk about the department a little bit, the Philadelphia Fire Department's been around for the last 150 some odd years. Uh, we cover an area of 141 square miles. We have a population of approximately 1.5, 1.6 million. When you look at the map on the left-hand side, you'll see a blue star. And that star is almost dead smack in the middle of the city. And that represents uh, Colorado Street. All the red dots on that map represent a firehouse. Right now, we're approximately 2,900 members in 2023. We have uh, a budget of 2,300 members, and we're still hiring at every day. Um, the city is broken up into three divisions, 13 battalions, 61 engines, 60 medic units, a heavy rescue unit, a hazmat unit, two squad companies, two fire boats. Our annual budget right now is, is pushing over $400 million annually. This is the area of the fire dwelling. It's um, it's in lower North Philadelphia. It's just north of Temple University. Um, the numbered streets, which are on the bottom, it's the 17th down here, is usually the larger streets. Colorado Street is a smaller street. The, the fire dwelling was uh, right smack in the middle of the block. So it was about 300 feet, 350 feet from the next intersection. Um, the way we're looking at it right now, the top of the screen would be west, the bottom of the screen would be east, so the right side would be north. Uh, engine 45 responds down um, Dolphin Street, which is on the right side of the screen here, and they park on the corner. The south side of the street is Susquehanna. The majority of the companies responded, responded to the north side because that's the way the, the traffic flow went. Um, one of the things you can see when you look in this, in this map is the vegetation in the rear. The alleys in these properties um, are, are, are very tight and they're very overgrown with uh, vegetation. And that comes into play a little bit later. The fire dwelling itself. This is a Google Earth um, depiction. One of the things you can tell is how narrow the street is. The street is approximately 14 foot wide. And one of the limitations of that 14 foot wide street is we cannot fit an apparatus on that street. When you when you look at uh, a six foot apparatus, a 14 foot wide street, you know, or an eight foot apparatus in a 14 foot wide street, there's just a not not enough room. You can see the car parked on the lower left of the screen. That car is parked half on the on the sidewalk or the pavement, so another car can go by. The fire dwelling itself, it's, uh, you know, Alpha in the front, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Uh, Bravo and Delta are the same size. They're very similar. One of the things that you can see here is there's a, a, a breezeway or an air light in the back for windows. And it just makes the property a little bit smaller in the rear. And you can see the amount of vegetation that's actually on this, uh, the rear of this property. One of the things we didn't really talk about is that there was quite a bit of video and audio and uh, information about the front of the building, but we had very little or no, no video or pictures from the rear. It was just a very tight uh, area and it just was not accessible, only from the fire companies that were back there. You wanna say something, Bob? No, um, the chief mentioned, um... In, in the city, we're used to dealing with streets that are very tight and narrow like this. Um, we can't fit an apparatus down. It's a common practice and procedure. What and you'll see in a video that Engine 45 does pull up to the corner. A lot of times you'll run the high end of the block or the low end, whether it's 2286, uh, you'll take you know the other cross street. If it's 2200, you'll take the other side of the street. Um, and uh, and what's typical is, is our companies will stretch a three inch supply line down the block um, and then we'll connect to a gate at Y and an inch and three quarter hose line, three inches, um, three lengths of inch and three quarter standard procedure. So what, what you'll see in the video is not, um, unique, um, you know, or, or a weird circumstance. We train for it and, and this is our bread and butter. This is what we do. 
So this is the fire dwelling, and this is a very typical of a row house in Philadelphia. It's called a working man's house. It was built in approximately 1888. It was uh, built during the Industrial Revolution, and it was built for the workers of the factories that uh, uh, peppered this, this neighborhood. We're about seven or eight blocks from the railroad, and the railroad actually fed all of these neighborhoods with all the materials, supplies, and manufacturing, and they needed workers. And this was a, a typical house. Type three construction, 16 by 38. It's about 1,038 square foot. It's six rooms. If you put an inch and three quarter in the front door, you should be able to hit the back of the place. When we do our size up and we look at this particular building, we look at the facade, we start from the top. You can see the cornice really hasn't been maintained. It used to be an ornate structure. Now it's, a, it's some plywood that was put on there 20 or 30 years ago that is pretty much deteriorating. Uh, when you look at the first floor windows, you can see that the curtains that were in there are stained by the sun and they're probably brittle and falling, falling apart. You can see any of the plants that were in that window are now dead. The bars or the gates that used to be on the basement windows have been removed. And you can see that this house had oil heat at one time. This is the particular, this is the floor plan of uh, the first floor. You can see it's only two rooms at the living room and dining room connected with the kitchen in the rear. Um, the second floor would have been uh, three bedrooms and a bathroom staircase on the left hand side you would you would go in there was two doors you had the main um exterior door and then it was a small little um you know foyer area vestibule, really, vestibule area um with another door now I, I can't remember off the top of my head if that door was intact um but when you walk straight ahead a couple of steps into the property would be an open staircase going to the second floor which would be along the bravo side what we consider the bravo side of the dwelling um this is a uh, one of the few pictures. This is an after. This is we we took this after the fire, and it's the rear of the fire dwelling looking in, into the first floor. Um, due to wires being down in the rear and the structural condition of the rear of the property, the battalion chief in the rear did not think it was safe to enter this building from the rear. So most of the firemen entered through the front, and the rear was pretty much an exclusion zone. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. If the, if the front of the building looks okay, the rears are always in poorer condition. If people put any money into their house over the years, they'll put it into the front and maybe let the rear go a little bit. And I believe that the downspout was in this corner and probably from leaking water, you could see how it washed away the, um, the mortar and the bricks in the rear. We know that this house was built in 1888. We had the mortar analyzed, and we know that there was um, uh, no Portland cement in this mortar mix. It was just sandstone and lime, which is very consistent with buildings of this period. Um, Portland cement, I don't believe, was invented until just after this period, around the turn of the century or a little bit longer. And the uh, building techniques at this time did not have Portland cement in it. It was just not a not a readily available. This is the video. Yeah, you want to talk? You want to? Yeah, I, I want to talk about this. I want to play a video, and this is helmet cam video from Matt Letourneau. And why would I want to? I want you. I want to tell you what they're saying. Talk about talking about Matt for. Talk about Matt's All right. for real briefly. All right. Before I start this video, I just want to say a couple words about Matt Letourneau. As Rich said, Matt was 42 years old. He was part of the 183rd class that was hired in 2007. Bobby was a classmate. I was an adjunct for that particular class. When he died on Colorado Street, he had approximately 11 years with the PFD. Once we hired him, he, he spent some time as a fireman at Engine 43 in Center City. Then he got promoted, and his first assignment was Engine 57 in West Philadelphia. From 57, he goes to engine 45 on the A. He just spent three years there. January 6th was his last day at engine 57 or engine 45. He was supposed to be transferred to engine 44. During his time as an officer, he was an adjunct at the Philadelphia Fire Academy. 
And during the same time period, he also was a volunteer with the Springfield Fire Company in Delaware County, where he spent 27 years. He had an associate's degree in fire science from Delaware County Community College, and he worked with UL with their basement um, firefighting training at Delaware County. What we'll try to set the stage for now is the video of the helmet cam that Matt Letourneau was, at, was wearing. It's going to show an engine company coming down Dolphin Street. They're going to stop at the top of the street. Matt's going to yell to his guys, and a lot of this is, might be hard to hear, but he's going to say, we got smoke, guys. We got a job. He gives the order three inch to the bag. As Bobby mentioned earlier, three inch to the bag means there's a three inch water line is going to be stretched off the, off the truck, and it's going to be taken to the front of the fire building. The bag contains three lengths of inch and three quarter water line with a gated Y that's going to go on the end of the three inch water line. Uh, one firefighter is going to grab the bag and one firefighter is going to grab um, the three inch water line. The second firefighter on, on the truck, you're going to hear him say, yo, grab the bag. All right, buddy. He's telling the brand new guy because we, we during this time we were using um, brand new firefighters in busy companies as like a training assignment. So they were, they were going for one month at a time in the busier companies. So the experienced guy tells the younger guy, you got the bag, I got the three inch. Matt says to the guys, I'm gonna run down to give a report. And you're gonna see he grabs his thermal imaging camera, he has his SCBA on and he runs down the street. And that's what you're gonna see when he's gonna give a report. He reports a two story occupied dwelling and he puts two engines and two ladders in service. For this particular assignment, we sent four engines, two ladders, two chiefs, and a medic unit. But he puts two and two in service. That means he'll put in an initial attack line and a backup line. When he does that, that also triggers the fire communication center to dispatch a, a RIT company, which will be a RIT ladder, a, a SOC company, and another additional medic unit. That's an automatic dispatch with two and two in service. When Matt gets to the front of the building, he's gonna tell us guys, uh, we're gonna hit it from here, then we're gonna go in. So that's his orders to the guys. And it's a very short video. And I probably spent more time telling you what you're gonna hear than actually what you're gonna say. And, and that was due to the fact that they had to get forcible entry. So that's why they made the decision while while forcible entry is happening, we're, we're going to knock down some of this fire that's blowing out the windows. All right, here we go, Rich. Eighteenth and Dolphin Street. Fires reported two 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 zero North Colorado Street. Report two 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 zero North Colorado Street. All companies are reminded fire ground channel will be South Fire South Take Two. Yes, yes, one. Thank you, 45. Thank you, 45. Thank you, 45. Ladder 14, all the locations. 2240 North Colorado Street. Two story, middle of the road dwelling. 15 by 35. I got fire shown, first floor. Bravo and Delta, same size dimensions, all occupied. Going service two and two. All occupied, Bravo and Delta, that's permanent. Two and two and two and service. We're going to hit it from here right away and then go in. So that was a pretty powerful video. So I, I, I thought it was very important that we show it. Um, like I said, it's a little hard to hear exactly what they're saying. But we've watched this probably hundreds of times and analyzed it. Uh, a couple of the other things that you've seen there, there was a police officer on the on the right hand side of Matt on the sidewalk. He was also wearing a body cam. So we have his video also. 
When you look down the street, you can see the uh, the volume of smoke was almost going horizontal. And we've seen that through much of the fire. And we contributed that to the cold temperatures, the nine degrees, um, keeping that smoke down. Uh, we had to, we analyzed the smoke a little bit with um, uh, the art of reading smoke. Uh, Dotson, Dave, Dotson. Dave Dotson, and he helped us out with that, and he contributed a small piece to our report. Um, and, but that was a big part of it. That that smoke um, weighed weighed down with the moisture going horizontal. Um, it really masked the uh, amount of fire that was in that that building. Uh, but obviously, when he pulled up, you could see they had two windows of fire. The fire was burning for some time before the fire department was called. The first person who reported this particular fire was a woman walking down the street, and she heard popping behind her. She passed the, the uh, front of the dwelling, and the front windows blew out. She went down the street to the store to dial 911. At the same time, a woman in the, across the street in another house heard the popping again, and she calls 911. And she's the first uh, person to report that fire. 45's had about a three-minute response time to this location. They arrived with the ladder right behind them. It was a coordinated attack. The second uh, engine and ladder responded uh, within minutes. We had, you know, all the companies were on scene within uh, three to six minutes. Um, so everything in the initial stages of this fire were pretty much routine. And they worked out pretty well. Um, the video is not going to show, up, but they make forcible entry to the front door. They find a fatality just behind the door. There was a lone occupant of the house. Um, he, you know, he lived there without utilities for several years. Uh, one thing I didn't really mention that, that this particular area of the city is uh, depressed. Um, the majority of the people, or not the majority, about approximately 25% of the people in Philadelphia live below the poverty line. In this particular neighborhood, it pushes up closer to 50% of the people in that particular neighborhood are living below the poverty line. Even though it's very close to Temple University, which has regentified a lot of that neighborhood, this area, because the streets are a little bit smaller, the houses are a little bit less desirable, it just hasn't taken off that far north. All about the operations? A uh, little bit about the operations. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we talk about sending a four engine companies, two ladders, and two chiefs to any particular fire. So the first in battalion chief, which was coming up the street as Matt was coming down, he, he would assume command from Matt, and he would be the incident commander. He had engine 45 and an engine uh, 50 in the front. Engine 34 and engine 13 were in the rear along with battalion 12. So he had two engines in the front, two engines in the rear, a ladder in the front, ladder in the rear. He had the rescue as a force multiplier, which was dispatched initially on the box. And battalion three was in the rear. The one photo I did show with a rear showed you how tight that was. You couldn't get very far from the building. They wound up cutting down every chain link fence in, the, in every yard in order to give them a little more operating room. There was a tree back there that actually blocked the whole alleyway. It, you, it, it must have been grown for 30 or 40 years, uh, unabated, and it basically was an immovable object. They wound up cutting the fence down around that just in order to uh, have access. Um, and other standard practices, we use the exposure dwellings to access the rear. So in this case, they would um, stretch a supply line uh, through an exposure to get to the rear of the property and then connect with engine three quarter water line. So we know that engine 45 was dispatched at 851. They arrive 854. At 906, battalion uh, eight places all hands in service. He's got all the engines working, all uh, the ladders working. He's got everybody in service. Um, during this time, he's getting reports that companies don't have water. And in, embedded in the report, we have a diagram of uh, who has water and at what time. And in the initial phases, 
Uh, you know, we had uh, we only had one company with water, and some sometimes it would be engine forty five, and sometimes it would be engine fifty. And because of that, and the reports that he was getting, he pulls everybody out of the building. So approximately zero nine ten, we're about sixteen minutes into this job. He pulls everybody out. After he pulls everybody out, um, they reestablish water, and we they send the guys back in. One of the challenges they had during this firefight was they could not find the stairs to the second floor. One of the things we mentioned in the, uh, the contributing factors was excessive clutter or hoarding. It's um, There was a lot of stuff in there. And uh, that was an impediment for the companies to find the stairs to go to the second floor. And you, you got to remember, you have nine degrees temperature, you have water problems coming and going, you have a lot of stuff in there, you have zero visibility, you can't see anything, you go in there and you're slipping and sliding on the debris that's actually in that dwelling. Thank you to retired Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief Vince Mulray and Battalion Chief Bobby Kennedy for honoring the life of Lieutenant Matthew Letourneau by sharing your story and lessons learned with us today. Remember, this is part one of a two-part interview, so be sure to come back next week for the second half of this interview. If you've been following along with me on social media, you know that I took a six-month sabbatical from teaching live events from March through September of 2023. For 14 years prior to the pandemic, I had consistently delivered between 90 and 120 programs a year. Whew. Taking some time off was really valuable and helped recharge my batteries and helped me to remind me of just how passionate I am about the topic of situational awareness. That time off also provided some space and opportunities for our certified master instructors to step up and deliver some programs as well. And now, as Willie Nelson most famously sang, I'm on the road again. Uh, so if you're interested in joining me for one of our upcoming programs, here's where we're gonna be in the near term. On January 22 through December, through February 2, we will be at the Syncrude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. At the conclusion of this vi visit, I will have delivered 71 programs for Syncrude employees as part of their period of high vulnerability program, where we're helping process operators with the skills to help them make have better situation awareness and make better decisions in stressful situations. On February 5 through 9, we're going to jump south of Fort McMurray and go to Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Edmonton, Alberta. Suncor is the parent company to Syncrude, and since Syncrude had experienced, in their words, a fundamental change in their organizational culture as a result of our training, the program is now being rolled out to their other refineries too. And this will be our third visit to Suncor Edmonton Refinery, and Master Instructor Drew Moldnar will be taking the lead on training, uh, doing this training, as he will for Syncrude as well. February 10, I will be delivering a program for the, Can for the Canada Task Force 2 training group in Calgary, Alberta. And this will be my first time uh, to have presented for Canada Task Force 2, so I'm really looking forward to that. February 29th, I will be in Orlando, Florida, delivering a program for the Center for Public Safety Excellence Conference. This will be the eighth time that I will have presented for the CPSE Excellence Conference. So thank you for your faith and confidence in my message. March 1 and 2, I will be at the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department in Spotsylvania, Virginia. Uh, this will be the second program I've delivered for Spotsylvania volunteer fire department. So thanks for the opportunity. The first one was virtual during the pandemic. So this is my first live event with the members there. March four and five, I'll be at the University of Maryland's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Annapolis, Maryland. This will be my 22nd year presenting at the National Fire Service 
staff and command program. So thank you to the MIFRI director and the staff of MIFRI for that opportunity and for your faith and confidence over 22 years of uh, contributing to your program. I appreciate it. March 19, I'm sorry, April 19 and 20, I'll be at the Taos County Fire Department in Red River, New Mexico. And I'm especially excited for this program as New Mexico is one of the only, is the only state in the United States I have not presented a program. And next April, that changes. And our master instructors are working hard adding their programs as well. Collectively, they delivered more than 30 programs uh, to the schedule in the final quarter of 2023. You can always see a list of our upcoming programs and events at the essaymatters.com website. Also, I'd like to thank a few of the hosts for some recent programs and consultations that we had the opportunity to be part of. On September 27th, I conducted training for failure program for the Swiss Vale Fire Department, a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This was the sixth program I've delivered for Swiss Vale Fire Department and for other fire departments in their region. So thank you to Fire Chief Clyde Wilhelm for those opportunities and for your confidence in my message. On September 28th, I facilitated a discussion with accident investigators from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, in Morgantown, West Virginia. These are the investigators that uh, evaluate firefighter line of duty death incidents, and they're interested in building more content around situational awareness, high risk decision making, human factors, and human error. And they gave me the opportunity to come and help them with how to do that. On September 29 and 30, I conducted two programs for the Wisconsin Rapids Fire Department in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Uh, one on situational awareness and one on preparing for retirement, or as I call it, climbing down the ladder of success, be that by retirement or injury or other means. It's been a popular program, especially at Fire Chiefs Conference events. On October 4, I gave a presentation at the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference in Denver, Colorado. This was my second time delivering a program for the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference group, and it was a great turnout. It was the day of the national uh, 911 over your cell phone announcement thing, so it was a little chaotic and hectic there for a few minutes. Everybody knew it was coming, but it still uh, was a little bit of an interruption to our to our mission there. On November 9 to 12, I was at the International Association of Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officers Section Symposium in the Sun in Clearwater Beach, Florida. I wasn't presenting. I was there to award two scholarships sponsored by my company. The scholarships are designed to recognize emerging leaders. This year's winners were Assistant Fire Chief Jeff Drager from Maple Bluff, Wisconsin, and Battalion Chief Matt Alto from Estacada Rural, Fire District in Oregon. On November 27 through December 1, we were back at the Suncor Edmonton Oil Refinery in Alberta, training process operators on situation awareness and high risk decision making. And master instructor Drew Moldenauer came along with me and was part of that training as well. And on December 9th, I delivered a program for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association in Ocean City, Maryland. And that was my fourth time presenting for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association. So thank you, Maryland Chiefs, uh, for the opportunity to come back. And it was a great day, great turnout. Everything about it was fantastic. It was so much fun. If you're interested in hosting a live event or a virtual program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our, our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.
Well, that's it. Episode 401 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guests, Philadelphia Deputy Fire Chief Vince Mulray and Battalion Chief Bobby Kennedy. Thank you to our viewers and listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always.